Good afternoon. It is Monday, September 20th. The ag market team is together to uh, discuss what the heck's going on in the markets. And right now, I know lots of times our group likes to dive into kind of the macro picture of corn, beans, and wheat and livestock or what's going on. But right now, uh, we kind of have more of a macro-driven market phenomenon coming out of the weekend. There's a couple big stories that are really pushing the market, guys. Um, we can bring everybody in to discuss it. Uh, the first one, probably the headline story, is China Evergrande Group. They've got about a $300 billion worth of debt that is about to come due. Um, the question is, can they make that service payment? What's going to happen? Um, you know, a lot of people in the world are equating it to kind of the Lehman moment. Will the Chinese let it implode like the United States did with Lehman? Or is it going to be more like the AIG moment when the United States government socialized AIG blowing up and essentially had the taxpayers bail them out? That's the question everyone's looking at. That's putting a lot of pressure on the stock market today. But that's not the only thing out there, guys, I believe that's kind of affecting the stock market. That is the main headline, but there's two other things that we need to look at. First one is Mark is a little bit spooked. We have the Federal Reserve FOMOC meeting this week. That is when we're going to get a better idea. Of the, is the government going to taper or not taper? Um, you know, years ago, they started trying to back off the tape, you know, what they, you know, tried to back off the stimulus affecting the stock market. And we had what was called a taper tantrum and the stock market tanked because the stock market is addicted to the Fed pouring money into the system. And then lastly, um, which is going to come to the forefront very, very quick is uh, the federal debt ceiling is going to be hit relatively soon. It's kind of a moving target, but somewhere in the middle of October. And right now there's a debate of what's going to happen with this. Now, Mind you, this debt has nothing to do with what the government and what the Democrats want to do from here on out and the trillions of dollars of spending they want to do. This is debt. Essentially, we're going to hit the limit, folks, of money that we've already spent over the last decades. Historically, the government goes to the line and then it kind of someone tends to blink. We'll see what happens right now. The Senate, the Republicans say they're not going to vote on it. They want the Democrats to do it through reconciliation. The Democrats are saying, hey, you guys are part of this debt problem. Uh, we want the vote in it. It's going to be a game of chicken. The last time we went to the chicken a few years ago, of hell, about 10 years ago, under the Obama administration, the uh, it got so bad they actually downgraded the U.S. debt a little bit due to uh, the politics that went around so those are the three things that are really driving the macro picture down today. On the far right, guys, you're seeing a snapshot of where the stock market was when we kind of set up for this recording around the 130 time frame. But I also want to kind of, before I bring everybody in to discuss what their thoughts about this may affect the markets, I want to show you this is a weekly S&P chart to put everything into perspective. This is today's bar. This is the Monday sell-off. To put it in perspective, the line right here on the far right and the bottom part, that is essentially the low made when Joe Biden was elected. And then obviously you had the March COVID low when the market puked out on the COVID concerns. So the reality is we've had a massive run here and maybe we did get the cart in front of the horse on the economy opening up on COVID. But uh, anybody else want to kind of give an idea of their thoughts about the macro picture affecting kind of the macro, the micro picture of our, what we like to talk about the grain market. Yeah, this is Brian. I think um, I know Goldman Sachs was saying that essentially the the biggest danger that this all poses is to uh, global contagion. Um, so the contagion effect basically occurs when uh, there is no clear um, fencing of risk. And so things start to spill over into other parts of the real economy or the financial sector. Uh, and so I think the uh, the analyst at Goldman uh, this morning in his note said that they thought that things were inching in that direction. Um, there is also some some signs they think are also pointing towards that contagion is already happening. Um, equities and bonds issued by other developers with high leverage have already sold off. Uh, you've got the protests at Evergrande offices across China that cause reluctance among potential home buyers more broadly. Uh, financing pressure faced by property developers has contributed to failed land auctions in a number of those cities. Um, so I, I think you've got contagion kind of spreading within China right now. And now the question is, how does that spread globally? Now, the one thing I, I do want to point out, what's a little bit different about the Chinese market compared to the U.S. market when we had our housing bubble 
you know, 10 plus years ago when everything imploded. What's interesting about the Chinese compared to us, we pretty much finance most of our houses. So when people buy a house, they may put zero, one, two, three percent down. In the good old days, it might've been five to 10% down, but now you can get a lot of hoes and mortgages for essentially no money down. Where the Chinese are a little bit different. When they have bought these houses to Evergreen, there's something like a million and a half people have actually put down payments for houses for these groups to build for them that essentially haven't built. But what's interesting is they put 100% of the money down, most of them. So unlike the U.S. where it was the consumer when it brought into all the banking, the people who are really going to be out on this specifically, at least on the housing side, it's actually going to be the Chinese people themselves. Hence what Brian was saying, they're actually protesting. And that becomes a real question, I think, to the Chinese government officials, how much political or, or popular unrest can he be before the pressure comes on to essentially not let them have a Lehman style default, but actually have an AIG type of bailout for the system. Well, Jim, Time will tell, but that's where we're at. What do you got, Bill? Well, I, I just, you know, I, I got to put a little bit of perspective on this. Number one, China's not going to do anything until they come back from their holiday in a couple of days. But, you know, there's no doubt, and I'm not downplaying the size of this. I think this is you know, this would be like one of our major developers going broke and everybody losing their deposits. It would be terrible. But I don't think that the that the feds are going to turn around and raise rates or taper, you know, until they see stability. I mean, consumer confidence two months ago was 81 percent. Today, it's 71 percent. And, you know, we're we're looking at a scenario here that I just don't think you see enough strength in the U.S. economy GDP growth rates at 6.6, that's really good. Uh, but an unemployment is 5.2, and a lot of people think that'll get even smaller. You know, inflation rate, the, the core group of inflation is, is running pretty high. But when you look at the food and the energy, that's actually really low. Food, I think, was at two. So we're, we're really just not in a situation where, as a Fed director, they're probably going to push real hard for a change. And therefore, I think that people are going to eventually be buying this. I wouldn't be surprised if by Wednesday, we don't see a bottom of the stocks. I'm bearish uh, stock markets. I've been trying to sell this thing since uh, oh, I was short Thursday, tried to resell it Friday and, and last night and was unable. But uh, I'm not bullish, but I don't think I'd, I, if anything, I'd be buying a break like this. I, I just don't, wouldn't want to put my hand under the knife. Well, I know, Brian, what was it you were saying today, the last time we had a hard break, what was it? I know we were talking about here in the office. Well, so I think if you look at an S&P chart, uh, there's been a, a couple times over the last several months where we've had one day where we've had a really big correction. Uh, but then generally what happens is the very next day we're right back up and, and we seem to take back everything we lost. Um, I'm working up a chart right now, though, um, comparing the uptrend in 2020 um, that actually started in, in, in about mid-2019 and then culminated when COVID really started to hit the markets. And so I'm trying to see how similar the structure is, but uh, it looks like today would be when we've kind of taken out the long-term uptrend uh, in the S&P over the last three or four months. And if we don't see this thing um, recover here, uh, you know, in, in the very short term, it's going to look a lot like the the setup that we had in, in 2020. Um, if you want me to, I can take the screen over here real quick and, and show that if you guys uh, want to take a quick look at that. Um, let me see here. Grab this. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen right now? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the top here, this is the March S&P back from 2020. And you can see we had this nice upward trending channel. Uh, and then coming out of uh, that uh, weekend, we, we sold off uh, aggressively. We took out this previous low. And then we actually saw uh, our little recovery the next day. You could see that we tried to go up. Uh, but that failed, and then it resumed uh, the pressure throughout the session, uh, and that really led to aggressive selling. Um, so this looks a lot alike. If you could see, you got this kind of two set low here that looks a lot like this. Then we started the uh, the upward channel, 
had a little correction, went and made new highs, another correction, new highs, another correction. Uh, and so when we took this low out, that really set the stage for this collapse. And so that would, to me, be the equivalent of this low. Um, so this market may try to recover tomorrow uh, and get back up towards some of these lows. And if we can't get through them, uh, again, I'm just trying to find some potential similarities here. But uh, these two charts look a lot alike to me as far as the timing of it, too. I mean, you have essentially uh, uh, about a four-month time frame in both instances where we've been in this channel before we ultimately broke down. Brian, so, uh, you, go ahead. And, yeah, go ahead. You think we could get back up? to the breakout point of today's highs? Cause I mean, I still want to sell this thing. I think it would be smart, especially if we're, we're going to have to eventually raise taxes and that's what's going to kill a lot of performance. So, um, I mean, it looks like here, you didn't quite get back up to that low. You got maybe somewhat close to it. Uh, where was this low here? Uh, we haven't taken out the equivalent of that low on this chart, but I don't know how much we try to bounce. And a lot of this may depend on the last hour. Uh, if you look at, um, real quick, if you look at um, uh, the daily chart on the S&P, let me just pull that up with the moving averages on here. Um, we're right at this 100-day moving average. So where we are in the last hour relative to this 100-day, that's this green line that might dictate whether the last hour today is is little recovery buying where we could try to get back up to this 4340 area. This is, you know, resistance. This is where you probably should be selling it. We made a low of 4340 this morning uh, and it looked like it could have been a double bottom and we had actually had a nice rally off of that early in the morning and then when we failed through this 4340 on the later half of the session, we really started to see the selling accelerate and then got down to this 100 day. Now we've traded below the 100 day, we've traded below 4,300. Uh, so to me, if we can maybe get a little bit above this 100 day, maybe the last hour is some short covering, some profit taking, but this 4,340 area is gonna be your first major close in resistance to sell against. The one thing I'd know, Bill, is be careful about looking at the chart too much. This is all due to headlines of fundamental headlines. They didn't sustainably tomorrow, China bells them out. Yeah. You know a macro driven move so be careful what yeah you know. I, I would say headline risk right now is is huge in both directions with the amount of emotion after a day like today you get a print that suggests you know the opposite of what we think is going to happen uh, the chinese come in and, and fix everything once they come back from holiday uh, market could be up very strongly tomorrow and take back quite a bit of today's move so How, can we talk about cattle next since it's so related to the economy Yeah, I, I would say, you know, let's have Ross speak about it. Um, I, I think just from a perspective today of what did we do in cattle? I mean, geez, you have the world melting down around us. And granted, this market closes at 105 and the equities continue to trade. But to see feeder cattle open lower and actually close higher, to see live cattle in the most traded contract, that's this December contract, open lower and close higher well off the lows near the highs of the day, that actually looks pretty good. Now we'll see what the equity markets are doing when we reopen tomorrow morning at 8.30 and they, I'm sure the cattle will take some cues from that. But all in all, the, the performance today in, uh, in both live cattle and feeder cattle uh, was a lot better than what I would have expected if you told me the Dow would be down a thousand points. Yeah, I would, I agree with you, Brian. Um, you know, fundamentally for live cattle, cash was a little bit weaker here last week. Um, you know, just, just call it, you know, one to two lower, but, uh, the slaughter, you know, we started off last week, you know, with some very negative news with the JBS fire, that plant got up and running, um, and, you know, in pretty short order, missed the kill on Monday. And then, you know, we ended up on the week, they revised Saturday's slaughter down, um, 3000 head versus the estimate on Friday, but we still killed 657,000 head here last week, which that's a very strong kill. Um, exports they're you know just decent i mean they, they could definitely stand to be a little bit better but just along with what brian said i mean if you would have told me today that the stock market was gonna be down 900 points and we've sold off a little bit since cattle settled um at one o'clock but i mean they had all day to trade that and we were we were weak on the opening um and then yeah i mean it says brian said i mean cattle had 
one heck of a performance, especially feeder cattle. Um, the one other thing I will hit on is it is hard for me to get bearish. So we've had a big sell-off, you know, in live cattle and feeder cattle, especially feeder cattle. Um, and I would say as of today, um, I would venture to guess that we'll probably see on the cow report this Friday that will be reported as of tomorrow's close. I'll venture to guess we'll see uh, the managed money crowd is probably short feeder cattle, which they do not spend very much time short feeder cattle. They did get a record short here. Uh, it was about a year ago this time. Um, and it was in October, I believe, off the top of my head. Punchline is managed money crowd, they do not spend a whole lot of time short feeder cattle or fat cattle. And in the last few weeks, they've really knocked out a lot of that, you know, live cattle long as well. So I don't know. It was a very good performance in the wake of, you know, two, this is two Mondays now of some very negative news. And both, both, in both cases, live cattle and feeder cattle, you know, have, have had a pretty good recovery. So. All right. Oh, yeah. And you know, some. I think on the positive side, probably Ross helping out the cat a little bit. I mean, there is some good news on this COVID front, at least. It looks like the cases, you know, the 14-day change is down 8% for total cases as well as hospitalizations. So, uh, you know, it seems like when we have these runs, they last a couple months, and then they kind of back off on the COVID. It looks like we're a little over two months into this uh, third wave. It looks like it's backing off. So hopefully that's a good sign that we are starting to uh, turn the corner and we'll, we'll get people going back out to eat um, and doing, you know, their thing with that. On the grain front of the equation, um, inspections came out today. They were a little bit so sour again, essentially for the corn and beans. That continues to be the problems, folks, with trying to get these ports opened up on the golf situation. I don't know if anybody can really get any more news. I mean, I know there's still a few that are down. A couple of them say they could be down to the end of the year. Is there any, have Kevin or anybody, have anybody heard any brand new news about the port situation in, uh, in the golf before we move on? Okay, we'll move on. Like I said, we'll see what happens there. Um, I am going to bring Matt Bennett in a little bit to talk about yields real quick. But um, one thing, Matt, before I bring you in, I do want to uh, just remind you, uh, my Boilermakers will be taking on the Fighting Illini this upcoming weekend. Uh, we'll see who can match us. I think right now, technically, Matt, the universities are tied 54-54 uh, and win losses. So uh, we'll see if the Indiana – uh, team can beat the Illinois team, but what are you seeing yield-wise uh, down there in parts of your neck of the woods? I feel a lot better about corn and bean yields than what I do my fighting line. I'll say that uh, we're one and three. I'm not going to be betting you money unless you give me several points. But uh, <laughs> regardless, corn and beans in our part of the world, especially on highly managed acres, just extremely good. Uh, there's a lot of uh, corn that I would say is meeting expectations. Uh, you know, I don't want to say we're exceeding, but in fairness, our expectations were sky high. So, uh, you know, we got into corn last week and then late in the week, we got into some beans. So we had a little bit of a shower overnight. So we're back picking corn. If anybody saw me doing that earlier, but, uh, you know, we're, we're picking corn as we speak. And, it, and it's, um, you know, the, the field that I'm on is going to, it'll be the best yield I've ever had, you know, on any field. And so, you know, I'm not going to throw numbers out there, but in this part of the world, there's going to be, you know, certainly some record corn. Now, you would expect that, well, given that Illinois is at 214, uh, but I guess I'll just throw my two cents in on this after hearing, you know, from a couple of different agronomists that I trust quite a bit. Uh, you get uh, west of the Illinois River, and the state of Illinois has got some serious issues with disease. Uh, we're hearing about a lot of yields that are running, you know, maybe 40 to 50 under expectations. Uh, no, we're not seeing that where I'm at, but uh, when we see that, that tells me that the state yield for Illinois is likely too high. But in fairness, you know, you go across the river, and I think there's a lot of Iowa corn that's actually exceeding expectations. So it's probably a mixed bag, but I do think that this national corn yield has probably got as much chance of moving lower as what it does moving higher. Uh, whereas on soybeans, we might be going the other direction. Our beans are awfully good here, too. And I certainly haven't heard near as much disappointment in early bean yields as what I've heard uh, for early corn yields. I would I would agree with pretty much what you said, Matt. That's kind of what my customers are saying here. Is, you know, corn's been relatively disappointing. Beans definitely have been good. Um, I do want to make note of uh, this graph right here is kind of the tar spot. We've seen a lot of people talk about it. Um, our um, Betsy Jibbing, uh, our uh, media 
personality. She has done a very good um, art uh, presentation or um, I don't want to I'm blanking on what I want to call it of, about of about the tar spot. It'll be on RFD TV, I believe, tomorrow morning. And then once it's played on RFD TV, we will be sending out kind of the research and kind of the commentary she's found on it. Are there any other comments uh, about the yields anybody else want to bring bring up? Hey, Jim, another thing I'd like to add, the tar spot is definitely a major issue. Pretty exciting piece that uh, Betsy put together on that. The thing that I'm hearing in Western Illinois that's really getting into folks' pocketbooks is it's a combination of not only tar spot but anthracnose uh, that has affected plants. Uh, and then you throw in there some of these areas that had abundant rain this spring, you know, and there's a lot of nitrogen loss. So uh, really there's a whole uh, array of things that have kind of gotten into this yield. But I think we have to understand that there's going to be big yields out there in places, probably on some of your higher managed bush uh, acres. But at the same time, uh, you certainly don't want to ignore whenever there's so many uh, producers talking about much lower than expectations because you've got to think any producer uh, survey approach, uh, you're going to see that reflected whenever we uh, we come around to the USDA report. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Are there any other comments? Okay, with that, we will wrap it up. Brian and I will be back on Wednesday with our weekly technical analysis. And then next week, kind of a little prelude, we will be taking a deep dive into uh, the quarterly grain stock report that'll be out at the very end of the month, which I think has the potential to be a very big market mover. Like I said, we'll go into that, uh, idea, trade ideas for that report uh, next week with that. Have a good week of trading. If there's any questions, please give the Ag Market team members a call at 844-424-6758. Thank you.